Hi all, welcome back, Natural Resources. I'm Dr. Will Clark, and today we're going to talk about environmental movement, kind of the precursors to the environmental movement, who the major players of the environmental movement was and is currently, and um, really this is kind of the history of it. And throughout the semester, I'll, you know, I'll introduce other individuals that are playing a, a big role in it today and you know what what their role is and and what they're doing and um, and we'll go from there so the first thing I really want to talk about are these three books okay? one that all of you that are taking the course are very familiar with and that is Sand County Almanac but the other ones maybe you're not so familiar with or maybe you've heard of them but I suggest that you uh, you know Explore these, read these. Um, they're excellent books, especially if you're interested in nature and um, you know man's place in nature and what's going on with um, nature at different stages. Okay, so the first one is Man and Nature, okay, by Marsh, George Perkin Marsh, Perkins Marsh, um, wrote this book. A uh, um, long time ago, mid 1800s and uh, really was one of the very first people to demonstrate that or write about um, the facts that humans have a role in nature and need to be careful with their actions and that basically every action a human does to nature will have a reaction or can cause issues okay so clear-cutting forests or dredging wetlands or plowing up grasslands all of these will have consequences and um, Marsh's book really lays out what he believes to be mistakes that we've made um, and how we can um, modify our human actions to be better stewards of nature okay. um, so that's an early book and that's uh, you know, a piece of literature that a lot of the pioneers to the conservation movement used. Okay. San County Almanac um, by Aldo Leopold has been called by many the Bible for the environmental movement. Okay. And it wasn't, it wasn't a big book at, at the time, like not, you know, when it came out in in 1940-ish, okay, um, late 1940s, uh, it was it wasn't very well recepted, and um, not a lot of people actually read it. Okay, but into the 60s, people started picking it up, um, and it became, uh, you know, one of those books that people would pass to other people that were of like mind, and um, and it's a very very easy read but it's very deep. Um, there's a lot of poetry in the book. There's a lot of hidden, hidden meaning in the book. And, you know, even today when I reread it for however many times I've read it, a hundred times maybe, um, I find new things that I might have missed the first time I read it. And that's really because as I progress as a scientist, I start looking at issues from a different point of view. And that's what all the Leopold was really gearing towards when he wrote this book is for individuals to explore both sides of the coin and okay? for individuals to realize that things aren't black and white, okay? that there is a lot of gray and um, there are right ways to do things and then there are wrong ways to do things. But just because you do something wrong doesn't mean that you can't make it right and so and this is in regards to nature and conservation and things like that okay. and then the final book that I have here is Silent Spring by Rachel Carson most of you have probably heard of the book um, she was what a lot of people call the whistleblower uh, that gets a negative term now but during the time it was a, it was a very important position and, and she was a whistleblower on DDT and insecticides and pesticides. Um, you know, she documented scientific, she's a scientist, documented scientifically 
you know, that DDT and these other pesticides are having detrimental effect on birds. And so hence the title of her book, Silent Spring, she was noticing that a lot of birds were not reproducing, they weren't coming back, they were dying, and the populations were decreasing quite a bit. And she connected it to a lot of the pesticides and insecticides that we were using at the time. Yeah. So <clears throat> my opinion purely, all three of these books are, are amazing books. Um, my favorite is San County Almanac, but uh, nonetheless all of them are, are excellent reads and um, if you're moving into the environmental science or you're interested in environmental science, I'd, I'd definitely pick up these three books to check it out. So um, that moves me into kind of the history of environmental movement. So if we look at the early or the stages of the environmental movement, okay, we're still in stage four, but and progressing. Now there may be a fifth stage, we don't really know, okay, but the early stages were not concerned with preserving land rather than conserving land. So the pragmatic resource conservation. Okay, so this is stage one, and it was really based on Marsh's book, okay, Man and Nature, which was published in 1864. Okay, and George Mar Marsh's book was really integral in driving some key individuals that were in a position to make policy changes to utilize United States resources for the purpose of conserving natural resources. Those two players were Theodore Roosevelt and Gifford Pinchot. Okay? And so Theodore Roosevelt, as most of you know, and we'll talk more about him in a second, okay, was a president. Okay? And his chief, what you would call a chief environmental advisor, or when he was in the position, was called the chief U.S. Forest Service, the chief of the U.S. Forest Service, Gifford Pinchot. They had a mindset of conservation, okay? To utilize money from the government to conserve lands so more people could use it. Um, they wouldn't be detrimented. The lands would still exist for generations to come. And that's really what they set out to do. Sometimes it was by setting aside land. Sometimes it was by um, dictating who could use the land and how much of it, um, charging for the land, these kind of things. But that was really their efforts to set up land so it existed in the future. Now there's a picture of Teddy Roosevelt and a picture of Gifford Pinchot. Now most of you have probably heard their name. I mean, well, you definitely heard of Theodore Roosevelt. But most of you have also driven through forests. If you're in the western part of the United States, you've been driven through forests or on roads or stopped at monuments or um, trailheads or something like that that were called pinch owl, okay? pinch owl, you know, highway, these kind of things. They're all named, out, you know, all those pinch owls are named for Gifford Pinchow, who was the first United States Forest Service chief. All right, a little bit about Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt um, wrote this. I, I think it's a pretty good quote about his ideology, and that is, we have fallen here to the most glorious heritage a people ever received, and each one, each, and each one must do his part if we wish to show that the nation is worthy of its good fortune. What he's really talking about here is the notion that we have a massive amount of natural resources in the United States. We have clean water, we have forests, we have grasslands, we have excellent habitat, we have you know wild game. And that's what Teddy Roosevelt was talking about is that you know when the people who occupied what we now call the United States of America came to this land they inherited a great resource. And then he goes on to talk about, you know, why don't we keep that great resource 
great. Okay? So how about every generation gets to experience this great resource? Okay? So in doing so, he was the president from 1901 to 1909. And during his pre presidency, he did a lot of things. A lot of things that you know some of you might not agree with. Okay? Um, but he did a lot of things for the conservation of the natural environment. He created the United States Forest Service in which he made Gifford Pinchot the first chief. Okay. He established during his time 150 national forests. Okay. And because Teddy Roosevelt was an avid hunter, okay, so he he's wrote other books and stories about you know, hunting in Africa and on lots of different continents and, and hunting in North America and things like that. But he was an avid hunter and he believed that there was a place in nature for hunting and fishing, right? that one could do this as long as they did it wisely, as long as the organisms that they're hunting had a fair chase or, or could get to areas that um, they were protected right? or could raise their young in areas that they were protected. So you got to remember in the 1900s right, the game laws and fishing regulations in the United States were none basically. Um, you could do whatever you want so uh, if you wanted to shoot a female duck when she's on her nest with eggs, you could do that, and many people did. Right? If you want, if you wanted to shoot deer, elk, whatever it is, at night, right, with the use of a light, you could do it. If you wanted to bait them in, you could do it. Okay? And there are so many regulations and laws that we have now that protect it that protect the organisms during their most vulnerable time and we owe a lot of that thinking to Theodore Roosevelt. He set up 51 federal bird reserves right? so birds had a place that they could nest and reproduce on. Game preserves, right? four of them, 18 national monuments including one of the most famous ones that we have in Wyoming which is Devil's Tower National Monument and five national parks where we'll talk about national parks but national parks are based on what we call preservation not conservation to preserve the environment okay? and in national parks you cannot remove materials from the national park okay? so you can't log and you can't hunt and things like that because that area is for preservation now there are some regulations that allow you to do minimum take okay, when organisms become overpopulated. We'll talk about those much later okay, in, in the semester. Okay, so all in all Teddy's policies, procedures, and money that he um, set aside really protected roughly 230 million acres of public land. Okay. Gifford Pinchow Okay. was what I would call the bulldog or what I would call the right-hand man of Teddy Roosevelt. So Roosevelt had lots of other things that he was doing as the President of the United States. It wasn't all conservation. It wasn't all you know occupying lands and setting aside, aside materials and things like that. Gifford Pinchot's job was to do that. Okay, so Roosevelt gets a lot of credit for that, but it was Pinchot's job, okay? And he's known as the pragmatic utilitarian conservationist. Okay? And the reason why um, Gifford gets that kind of name or notation is because of many things that he's quoted saying. And that is, you know, like this quote, for the greatest good, for the greatest number, for the longest time. That's how Pinchow um, wanted to regulate the United States Forest Service. He wanted uh, game to be regulated this way, fishing to be regulated this way, water rights, okay, land rights in general to be all regulated 
for the greatest good, for the greatest number, for the longest time. And that's really the ideas behind conservation, and that's the ideas that we still have today for the U.S. Forest Service. So we're talking the U.S. Forest Service, um, we're talking, you know, early 1900s is when it came about, and they still have not really changed their, their motto. Their motto is really to allow people to use the land as they see fit, but not to abuse it, and to give other people the right to use the land at the same time. And that's really where the multiple use policies come in. So you have the ability to off-road, horseback ride, fish, hunt, bird watch, hike, okay? um, collect firewood, collect mushrooms, you know, lots of different things you can do on camp, you can do on Forest Service land. And that's part of that multi-use policy. And that was really put forth by Gifford Pinchot. So let's take a look at what it was like okay, in the 1860s okay, when, when a lot of these policies started to come to fruition okay, um, and the ideas started to come in and then early in the 1900s is when um, you know, this really started coming forward um, and you started seeing the buying of land and, and the U.S. Forest Service being created and things like that. If you take a look at the 1860s, you can see that the western part of the United States is pretty much not states at all. Okay? These are all territories. Okay? Now you had a couple states, Oregon, California, Texas, okay? but for the most part, you know, most of it's just territories. Which means that it's not part of the United States, but the United States owned the land. Well, had the potential to own the land, as long as they took it. Okay, um, which is another story for another time. So Gifford Pinchot saw this as a huge opportunity. Okay? The eastern part of the United States was all, almost, almost all of it was private land. Okay? People have already staked claim, they already had the land, okay? and so Gifford Pinchot knew that there's no use in trying to spend government money buying land on the eastern part of the United States when you could use government money to purchase, steal, uh, borrow for a lifetime land on the western part of the United States. And that's why when you pull up a map today of the federal public lands, okay, so the lands that are controlled by the U.S. federal government, okay, you can see that Everything in red is controlled by the government. Okay? And that's pretty much all of the western United States is governmentally controlled. Okay? You look at the eastern United States, there's very little over here, almost all privately controlled. So often people ask, well, you know, what's going on? Why is this? And um, it's because when Pinchot and... and uh, Theodore Roosevelt came into office. This is what the land was, what land was left for them to buy and start setting aside. Okay. If you overlay a map of national parks and state parks and and Forest Service land and and BLM land that that you know is named and national monuments and wilderness wilderness areas, this side of the United States is covered in it, and this side over here has very few. Okay. Now, you can see that as a good thing or a bad thing. Okay. My personal opinion is it's a good thing. Okay. I like to be able to travel onto land okay, in Wyoming, Utah, Montana, Nevada. I like to be able to set foot on land without having to know who the owner is. Okay. But some people see it as a negative thing okay, because if you want to run cattle, from you know up here to down here, you have to cross government land. So that means you sometimes have to pay a fee to cross the government land, or you at least have to contact them, and they can dictate when you can cross it, how many cattle can cross, these kind of things. Yeah. And so there are issues. We'll talk about 
benefits and costs uh, to both, but realized that it was Pinchot and Theodore Roosevelt that set aside these lands because they felt that it was for the greatest good, for the greatest number, for the longest time. All right, let's look at the second stage. This would be the ethical or um, aesthetic nature preservation side. So that was conservation. Stage one was conservation. Stage two is preservation. Okay. And that really started with this man, John Muir, who was the co-founder of the Sierra Club, but also president of the Sierra Club. Right. And his, you know, background is very interesting. And John Muir was an immigrant, right. came to the United States, to Illinois, and um, eventually grew up, uh, went to college for a little while, but then due to the war, he decided to, you know, uh, leave the United States and go to Canada in fear that he might be drafted for the war. Okay, so he went to Canada, worked in the sawmill and things like that, and then after the war he came back. Um, and then from there, he went, you know, to a little more schooling, whatnot, Okay, and then he decided to go to California via Florida. Okay, so he actually walked from Illinois to Florida and then got on a boat and went to California. When he got to California, again, this is, you know, early 1900s, okay, um, he gets to California and really there's very few people. It's not, it's not heavily occupied. And at the time, you could stake, you know, you could claim pieces of land. Okay? Or even not claiming pieces of land, you could put up a cabin or a house on government land. Okay? And that's what Muir did. He went to the Yos Yosemite National Park, or what's now known as Yosemite National Park. It wasn't at the time. And he built a cabin. And um, he's notorious for being what we call... Uh, a nomad or someone who who had very little belongings and uh, would travel very light but he was also extremely intelligent right? so there's some things that he used to carry or what's often said that he used to carry he used to carry a 10 cup tea bread okay, and a book or two and that's what he carried with him wherever he went, and he walked everywhere. Okay? Um, but even though he went to college for a little while, he never really got a degree. Okay? He took a little bit of geology, a little bit of biology, a little bit of poetry, theology. Okay? When he was in college, he just took things that he liked. Okay? Never enough to get a college degree. So in most people's eyes, he was uneducated. But he was far from uneducated. If you look at John Muir, he published a lot of scientific papers. He published scientific papers on volcano activity, the Sequoia National Forest, um, landslides, earthquakes. Uh, he published a lot of a lot of scientific articles on these different things because he would collect data on the material and then present it. Okay? Well. <clears throat> It really brings me to a point between um, John Muir and Gifford Pinchot. Okay? They used to be friends. So when they first met, they were friends because they had like mindset. They wanted to uh, protect nature. Okay? But as time went on, Pinchot became more interested in conservation, which means, you know, basically you can use the land as long as you don't abuse the land. And Mir went the other way into preservation where you shouldn't touch the land. It's just there to look at, keep all the pieces together, okay, and don't take anything off. So you get this preservation versus conservation between these two individuals. And they started to clash in, in public. And so they would, they would fight over things and argue and whatnot. And... Um, and they really developed a deep hate for each other later on. And most of you have probably heard, you know, the term like mountain maggots when referred to sheep 
Okay, and that was John Muir's term. Okay, um, is that you know these sheep were so bad for the environment that they would eat everything and just destroy things. It's like a wound with maggots in it. Um, and Gifford Pinchot, on the other hand, thought you know the sheep ranchers um, were excellent for the environment and and played an integral role in bringing. Uh, the range to you know mountains and things like that where where people can utilize this land in, in a different way okay. <clears throat> that brings me to w one of the final people um, that were integral in the early parts of the environmental movement and, and in fact all the Leopold is basically known as the father of the environmental movement Okay. He was an author, scientist, he was a professor, an environmentalist, okay. um, and wrote you know, the famous book, A Sand County Almanac. Okay. But he didn't start off as an environmentalist. He started off as a conservationist. He was one of the very first, he was in the very first class at Yale for Forest Service. Okay. Got his degree and then worked for um, the Forest Service in New Mexico, in the territory of New Mexico, and it wasn't a state yet, okay, but worked there, and then jumped around and, and went to work at uh, the U.S. Forest Service Products Lab, and then he became a professor at the University of Wisconsin, and on and on and on. But Leopold's most famous, in, you know, in my opinion, for bridging conservation and preservation, for laying out the idea that we need both. Okay? So he was integral in designing wilderness areas, okay? national park systems, the Forest Service management, he worked for the Forest Service, game management, he, he created the very first textbook for game management, um, state parks, and he was really, really, really um, important in all these aspects and trying to get the idea across that just preserving the land was not enough. Just conserving the land is not enough. But doing both is what we need to do. We need places where humans don't destroy the land. We need places where humans can take resources that are needed okay, as long as they're doing so wisely. Okay? And that's kind of way, the way that all the Leopold approached science and and that's kind of why um, this quote is so meaningful okay? a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity stability and beauty of the biotic community it is wrong when it tends otherwise so Leopold's um, you know actions and and uh, education that he provided for people really kind of drove the environmental movement the modern environmental movement out of kind of the what I would consider non-scientific point to a much more scientific approach. Okay? So the modern environmental movement really was post 1940s, okay? and this is when people started being what we'd call, you know, at the time whistleblowers or you know environmentalists and um, and. And it was a different mindset. Okay, it was a mindset of there are people that will destroy the land, and then there are people that need to protect the land. And that was the mindset from the 1940s to you know even modern day in some situations. Okay, like I said before, Rachel Carson was a huge inspiration for the movement. Um, or the modern environmental movement with Silent Spring, okay, she helped get DDT banned. Okay. Dr. James Greer, um, he's a bio, bald eagle uh, specialist and, and ecologist. He was integral in bringing the bald eagle back from extinction. And one of the main reasons we have the Environmental Species Act was because the nation's bird was on the brink of extinction. And Jim Greer uh, wrote lots of scientific articles, some that were super integral, showing that 
DDT affected bald eagles and the thickness of the eagle's eggshells, which really led to the banning of DDT. Richard Nixon, okay, you probably don't hear too much about Nixon being an excellent person, um, but Richard Nixon, as a president, did a huge amount of work for the environmental movement, passing things like the Endangered Species Act, the Clean Air Act, the Water Clean Water Act, all kinds of things. Now, if you know much about Nixon's presidency and you know much about what was going on, a lot of these issues issues his hand was forced. He had no in no possible way of not passing these because uh, of the way the set the government was set up and and things that were going on at the time. So, you know, a lot of people will say, well, he didn't really have an option. He just signed his name to all these. But nonetheless, he still signed his name and should get some credit for a lot of the environmental movement. Margaret Marty Murray, okay, and Ogley Murray, uh, husband wife team, uh, they started the Alaska, Alaska Land Act. Okay, which protected a massive amount of land in Alaska um, and still today it is integral for Alaska but also um, you know was a, a big um, a big voice for protecting wild places right? and is well known for uh, her role in protecting the environment along with her husband who was wildlife biologist and was the first elk biologist or first elk manager and um, is very important to the state of Wyoming. They both lived in Wyoming later in their lives. Um, they, they, they both passed away in Moose, Wyoming, um, but are very important for the Environmental Act. Howard Zanners okay, um, was basically the first author on the Wilderness Act. Okay, to set aside land that, you know, um, wilderness lands. Okay, so huge, huge role there. Okay, and then moving a little bit in more into modern times and things like that, Wenger Mafia okay, uh, took it from a, you know, kind of a United States thing for the environmental movement and moved it to other countries. Started the Green Belt Movement in Africa, Asia and India and really started getting individuals interested in you know restoring lands and replenishing food sources and things like that um, very important role and then Dr. Jane Goodall most of you know her work with chimpanzees and gorillas and things like that wasn't just you know for the fact that she loved these organisms but it was for the fact that she wanted to protect them from extinction and so she started lots and lots of programs, all kinds of programs. One that's very um, important was Roots and Shoots, and still is, uh, where money was given and, and donated and, and raised to get individuals um, to replant landscapes, to plant edibles, to take care of the land instead of to destroy the land, and was a big player in that market. All right, and the final piece that I want to talk about is where we're at today. Um, we're in stage four, which we call global environmentalism. Okay, and I would say that you know, under global environmentalism, you know, a lot of the players that we see today is technology based. Okay, um, the advancements in communications. Uh, you know, there is no really hiding from the camera today. So individuals that are going to destroy the environment um, they're well aware that there's probably someone videotaping them doing it okay and so from Earth Day to Eco News, Eco Watch, Facebook pages that are dedicated to YouTube which I have a link here which can show you um, a few days ago in Mexico okay, this was filmed Makes retying simple and fast under any conditions. Okay, not really that was filmed, but this was filmed. 
All right, so 300 endangered sea turtles were captured in fishing nets that were abandoned, um, you know, off the coast of Mexico, the southern coast of Mexico, and uh, so researchers now have this opportunity to um, document these things, these travesties to nature. We're talking about an endangered species here that you know is on the brink of extinction to begin with and then you know neglect from fishing nets or fishing communities do a number on their populations um, when it all comes to the end there so so the fact that you know modern technology that everybody you know almost everyone has a cell phone okay especially in the United States I think we're up to 80% or so of people in the United States have cell phones, okay, and 70% of those cell phones are, you know, touchscreen cell phones or modern cell phones, and they all come with a camera. Um, the amount of technology that people hold in their pocket now is a thousand times what it was, you know, when these first uh, environmental movements started starting being progressing and so now we have the capability of uh, showing what's going on in the world in a much easier way it doesn't mean we can change what's going on in the world much easy easier but it is a way to document what's going on in the world today okay so we're gonna stop there and I'll pick up talking about um, some more conditions in the next lecture